Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for Break Room Conversations. My name is Krista Bradley, and I'm the Director of Programs and Resources at the Association of Performing Arts Professionals, based in what we now know as of Washington, D.C., on land that was stolen from the Piscataway, the Monkey, and Powhatan peoples, among many other Native communities whose histories have been obscured, altered, and erased. We're happy to have you here. In addition to the Zoom platform, we also welcome our viewers on Facebook Live. Closed captioning will be available throughout the event and can be accessed by clicking on the closed captioning button at the bottom of the Zoom window as indicated. On Facebook Live, you can find Facebook's captioning uh, option under the video player settings. If you have questions during today's conversation, we ask that you submit them using the Q&A box and put any general comments in the comments box. While we won't be taking questions from Facebook Live, we encourage you to engage in a discussion with other viewers in the comments thread. Breakroom Conversations was inspired and developed in partnership with Sozo Creative. We also want to thank the Wallace Foundation for their generous support. This series was created in response to COVID-19 and its impact on the presenting, booking, and touring field. Our field has been in triage mode for months, working to stem losses, seek relief, and develop and share information to navigate this crisis. And yet many realize we need to reimagine how we work, both now and in the future. APAP and Sozo Creative, along with other artists, agents, producers, and cultural leaders, see this need too. We need to innovate ourselves through this crisis to recovery. More importantly, we need to transform how we think and how we work. We conceived and curated this series in four parts, a conversation in four acts, if you will, that would help us understand where we've been and imagine a new transformative future. Then came the murder of George Floyd, followed by international public outcry and protests. Then came the outpouring of grief and anger and calls for racial justice and equity, not just across our country, but in our very own performing arts and cultural field. And so we have sharpened our focus. We can help but hold these conversations through the lens of racial equity and inclusion while responding to the current crisis. We hope this series inspires and invokes action, more honest conversation, and deep listening that lead to real and transformative change. APAP is ready to help facilitate, support, and lead the change that needs to happen in our field to create a more just and equitable future. Here to share a few words about that future is our incoming president and CEO, Lisa Richards Tony. Lisa? Thank you, Krista, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Krista, thank you so much for your tremendous work. And to our partner, Sozo Creative, thank you for your uh, wonderful curation of this important convening. I also first wish, wish to acknowledge the APAP chair, Karen Fisher, and APAP's fearless leader, Mario Garcia Durham, who have been so supportive to me as I study APAP get to know all of you, reconnect with many of you before I assume the role of president and CEO on July 1st. Thank you all for coming and thank you to Duke Charitable Trust for your support and participation as well. The conversations we will have today are certainly part of the blueprint for our future. It is my hope that these presentations offer a catalyst to build on the ingenious momentum that our field is exhibiting right now. The sheer resilience and creativity is both inspiring and sustaining. What our future will look like, well, that's the million dollar question. Not one of us is immune to the liminal space that we are all in, the space of no longer and not yet. And in opening that liminal space, we must always be ready for the primal scream. But fret not, we in the performing arts, we know 
how to do this. We know what to do. We know how to channel this, celebrate on this, innovate on this. We have an opportunity before us to write the code for what should be, and we have a responsibility to hold ourselves accountable. So the future, it is ours to be determined. Yes, we want and need to open. Yes, we need funding. Yes, we need our people. We also need strategy so as not to develop a future rifled with the painstaking failures of our past. I look forward to joining you when I assume the role of president and CEO of APAP. And like all of you, I can't wait until we look back on this time and sing with great conviction how we got over. Thank you and enjoy the convening. Thank you so much, Lisa. And now let's tune to our first set of conversations, recovery, transformation, what comes next? Led by moderator, Christopher K. Morgan. Christopher? Thank you, Krista. Thank you, Lisa. Aloha, y'all. My name is Christopher K. Morgan. He, his, and pronouns. I am the Executive Artistic Director of Dance Place, a 39-year-old theater that presents dance performances by companies and choreographers from throughout our metropolitan area, throughout the land known as United States or Turtle, Turtle Island, and from around the globe. Dance Place is also a school for youth and adult dancers and a community arts center. I'm also the director of my own dance company, Christopher K. Morgan and Artists, entering its 10th year. And for 16 years, I've directed the International Dance Residency Program at Art Omai that takes place each summer in Ghent, New York. I'd like to begin today's discussion. Um, sorry, one more thing. My pronouns are he, his, him. You can see it in my name type line there. I would like to begin today's discussion by first acknowledging that most of us are probably joining to today's conversation from our homes. And that brings with, with it a multitude of things that will inform how we participate in this convening, including but not exclusive to our spouses and children, elders that we're caring for and pets, roommates, neighbors, also feelings of isolation, cabin fever, excitement, anxiety, exhaustion, and so much more. So I invite us all to be gracious with ourselves in the virtual space and the reality of work from home. I also want to acknowledge that these homes are all on lands that were taken from indigenous communities. For me, I'm calling in from what we now know of as Washington DC, near Krista and near Lisa. And as Krista beautifully acknowledged, um, I personally am in relationship with a few of the peoples of this region, the original peoples of this region, the Piscataway, the Pamunkey, and the Powhatan peoples. But there are so many other native communities whose histories have been obscured and erased. I invite you to take a moment to think about the land you are on, wherever you're tuning in from, and the people who lived there before you, and that this acknowledgement can serve as a reminder of the genocide against indigenous communities. Further, I'd like to remember that the establishment of the United States was financed by the sale of enslaved humans and built by their labor. We have a collective responsibility for that history and for continued acts of marginalization and oppression. Today's conversation is entitled, What's Next? And it is my hope that what's next centers equity. I also wanna take a moment to honor frontline workers, medical professionals, and community leaders who have put themselves at risk throughout this pandemic. And for those taking action to actively resist and dismantle white supremacy, police brutality, racism, and violence against our black communities. I personally stand in solidarity with those rising up against the continued efforts by police, our government, and white supremacists in our country to undermine and harm our black communities. Black Lives Matter. Finally, I want to take a moment of silence for the over 112,000 people who have lost their lives to COVID-19 in this land we call the United States or Turtle Island and over 400,000 worldwide. With that, let's just take a moment and think about that for a breath.
Thank you all. And all of that, all of it, brings us to today's conversation. What comes next? Recovery, transformation. What might radical innovation and recovery look like? And what roles do cultural leadership play in the process? The COVID-19 pandemic and its accompanying financial impact have had layered and devastating effects on all of us. As the arts community begins moving forward, this conversation with a group of incredible thinkers, artists, innovators, community, community leaders, will ask them what they imagine comes next. I hope it can be a dreaming space for them. Artists are always at the front line of innovation and the skill of the arts communities will be greatly needed as we innovate our way out of this, as Krista Bradley said recently in a call with her. So with all of that framing, I'd now like to introduce you to our first two panelists who will be in conversation with me. An incredible artist who makes body-based work is Emily Johnson joining the conversation and a powerful speaker who I was so moved by when she presented recently at APAP and an award-winning director and producer and the historic Apollo, Apollo Theater's executive producer, Camilla Forbes. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Camilla, for joining us. Thank you. As a way to introduce yourselves, I hope our panelists, uh, excuse me, our um, viewers have had a chance to look at your bios. Um, but as a way of introducing yourself, I thought a nice way to start the conversation would be to ask, um, give or take a few weeks, depending on where you are geographically situated, um, what have you been focusing on during the past three months? So in addition to your names and pronouns and any other way you'd like, in like to introduce yourself, I invite what's been your focus these past three months? Emily, would you mind going first? Sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Christopher. Um, I'm Emily Johnson. I'm here in my apartment uh, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the Napeho King. And I am from the Yupik Nation in Alaska. I grew up on Denaina and Kanaitsi land there. And my pronouns are she, hers. And the last many weeks, I've been engaged in trying to be there when I'm needed uh, and where I'm needed. So sometimes that's conversations, these kinds of public ones. Sometimes that's the phone calls and the texts. Sometimes that's from my dog <laughs> and my community members. Sometimes that's delivering food. I think delivering food has been the most um, generative thing that I've been engaged in in the past many months during COVID, like an action that I as a healthy person could take. Um, and, and, and to be able to share these intimate moments with community members, elders, uh, people who are immune compromised, these intimate moments where the door opens a little bit and you can leave a bag of food, you can say hello, and you can have a brief check-in. That has been really, really dear to me, that time. And I think paying attention to these new forms of intimacy, of listening, of breathing, and now of doing that with thousands of people daily for hours on the streets during protest. I think these, this focus on this this focus on collectivity, this focus on equity, this focus on transformation. That is, I feel like, where we all are right now and certainly where I have been trying to be. Thank you so much for that. And I think that's such a beautiful reminder to hear the way you spoke that we cannot divorce ourselves from the emotional intensity of this time. Um, I think many of us may be caring quite a lot from recent weeks, years, perhaps centuries of these systems of oppression. Um, and I so recognize the title of this incredible organization, the Association of Performing Arts Professionals mm -hmm. and honor professionalism. And also with my own self, sometimes recognize that professionalism can sometimes be steeped in a Western capitalist, sometimes white centered sense of what it means to be a professional. So I really welcome the emotion that I sensed in your voice across this digital platform and um, value and appreciate the work that you've been doing and holding space. 
Camilla, as we continue that, I welcome your range, full range of self as you introduce yourself to us. Name, okay. pronouns, and focus of the past few weeks. Um, so Camilla Forbes, um, um, she, hers. Um, what I've been focused on the past couple weeks is, um, you know, similar um, to what Emily said, and thank you for that articulation and um, the vulnerable articulation. Um, I, I've really been focusing on navigating change, um, trying to find the best way to navigate change. Um, also finding that the best way to navigate change is at, at times is stillness. Um, at times it's also force. So those are two diametrically opposed <laughs> um, states of being. And, um, and, and, but yet I find myself in the midst of both, right? As an arts leader, navigating change throughout this time period has been a challenge. Um, um, you know, being socially distant um, in a form in which is all about connectivity, is all about in-person. Um, so how do we carry out mission amongst this world? Um, and we're obviously navigating a very major change, um, uh, and I, I would say reckoning in, in, our, in, in our country, in our city, in our globe, um, around the importance of humanity, um, Black humanity to be particular. Um, so vacillating from that moment of stillness to also that moment of forced change, right? So that's, that, has been, um, that has been the past couple of months. For sure. As we were preparing for this conversation, this idea of personal and professional came up and Camila it was actually in direct conversation with you. So I wanted to see um, in my own life personally, I found that my sense of professionalism is totally wrapped up in identity politics. Mm. I've had this strong desire to please. I've had a lot, lifelong journey of trying to be a model minority. Mm. Um, big air quotes around those words, friends. Um, <laughs> and the pandemic and the social unrest and human rights protests of late are creating the possibility to readdress some of those lines of professionalism. Yeah. Um, and so I feel like we're poised now to create this new future where perhaps we can take time, foster more layers and deeper interactions. So I wonder, um, Camila first, and then maybe Emily, if you could comment on ways you see the personal entering your work. Maybe that's been a practice you've held for a long time um, and how that can foster social transformation. Mm. You know what I've been meditating on? So uh, an author who I've always been a huge fan of um, for such a long time has been Octavia Butler, right? Um, Kindred was my first, um, actually second rap name. Uh, the second rap group that I was in, actually in DC, um, was named Kindred after Octavia Butler, right? So that's, that's some, you know, her writing is real personal to me. Um, but I've been meditating a lot on, on the concept of Afrofuturism, right? Um, and, and why it's so important now, right? There's always been sort of this Afrofuturist mo movement moment. We think about Afropunk, if we think about, um, you know, science, Black science fiction authors, Black comic book authors, um, if we think about the rise of Black Panther. But I've really been meditating on Afrofuturism and how it informs the now and my own, my, my, my own personal and professional journey. Afrofuturism is, an, is a concept that really views black people as superheroes with powers to time travel, <laughs> to shape shift um, that are bulletproof, right? Um, with, with senses of immortality, um, but black people imagining themselves in the future, literally in the future. That has been such a powerful notion for me now in this time, um, um, particularly in this time, particularly today, you know, yeah. June, 2020. Um, so, you know, that's, again, so that's my sort of personal really beginning to inform how do we take these moments and nuggets of radical imagination to reimagine ourselves in the future and what and who um, we can be and not just Black people taking on this notion of Afrofuturism, but the globe taking on this notion of Afrofuturism, right? Humanity taking on a notion of Afrofuturism. So um, that's, that's really been, you know, has, has really been informing, you know, how I'm thinking and, and, and also thinking about um, 
you know, organizational institutional structure as well. But, um, but yeah, that's, I'll, I'll leave it there. That's beautiful. Um, it makes me think of conversations I've been in with Emily, um, particularly around the indigenous, native and indigenous community where sometimes it's hard for folks to imagine themselves in the future when they've been so clearly erased from the past not invited to future visit visioning. Emily, um, I wonder if you might jump into this, seeing the personal end to your work or even taking off where Camila left off so beautifully. I think um, from where you were speaking, Camila, I've been thinking a lot in the last many months about bringing the future here now, mm -hmm. being in, which I think is just a, a different way of, because mm -hmm. I have been in a process of community visioning and this, this these forward thinkings that, but it always leaves us like this. It leaves us in a future that's better here. And I've been thinking of like, how do we collapse this space time so that that future is here now? Like being in that better future, being in that future that we do imagine where we are in a radical relationality to one another, to our ancestors past and future, to the beings that are more than human beings, to our, to our collective and individual consciousnesses. Um, I think that's that future that that is being actually called here by by those who are on all of these front lines um, that are calling these front lines to be met to um, I work with my friend and sister uh, Cree scholar and futurist thinker uh, Karen Mekele and we we're, we've been writing this essay on this emergent time and thinking about the kinstillatory which is a, a process of thinking that Karen really works on articulating that is about a choreography of relationality to land and to beings, uh, to human to human and to beyond the human, and a technology to kind of a way to spatially orient and collectively dream. And, and this dreaming that we're speaking of and we like always come to is so uh, inherently met with action now. And I guess that personal and is the political and the, the way in which I personally try to root myself in transformational work is, um, is, always, is always challenged by the work that needs to be done, I guess. And that's where I am now. Radical relationality was something you just said, Emily. And Embrace, embracing Afrofuturism for all um, yeah. was something Camila said. Um, I, I love this radical relationality. Something that I find myself suffering from at times is the pace with which we all work and the volume of work that's expected of us. It's felt like the pandemic has allowed me to assess that anew. I think that's not um, a new theme that we've been hearing about. And so in that, I've also noticed that there's been a little bit more space and possibility for listening. Um, anecdotally or colloquially, I sort of wonder if the increased protests that we've been seeing, seeing lately compared to say 2014, perhaps that's partly because people have a little more listening capacity. No science behind that, just an observation and a wondering. And so as I envision a new future, one of the things that I would love to see is more space and time for deep listening. Um, you know, and especially in our art sector, sometimes it feels like it can move at such a rapid pace. So if the future could include that, you know, what are ways you see the arts community listening and responding, both now and in the future? What do you hope to see? How do we listen and respond? Camila. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a, I, I, I love, I mean, look, I'm, I come from directing, I come from theater. So listening is the core tenant of acting of responsiveness, right? Like, I, I, I think about this concept that we learn in acting school, right? I can't make a move or a, um, a, a motion um, or, an, a, a, un, you know, if I'm not, if it's not in direct response to my acting partner. Otherwise, it's called an unmotivated move. And if I do a whole bunch of those, that's called bad acting, <laughs> right? Like, we train actors in this way um, to be that sort of call and response. I do think though, um, when it comes to our institutions being nimble, when it comes to our institutions being responsive, um, nimble and responsive 
to what is happening in the world. And it doesn't just necessarily, and does not just mean from programmatic choices, but it's about systemic choices. Um, I think in many, in many times institutionally what is, um, what is lauded is if, if a structure can be maintained for decades upon decades upon decades, and that is a checkbox of success. Now we're being challenged, and I think and I hope, and the hope is that we ultimately will give gold stars to those institutions who can be nimble and responsive, who could be nimble and responsive to their structures, and I mean from board structures to artist administrative staffing structures to practices uh, from on down from marketing to development, et cetera. Um, it requires a different kind of muscle. Um, it, it requires, I think, a muscle that we, we must learn from our artists. <laughs> it, it, it requires that muscle that we have to exercise on a daily basis, right? Um, and um, so, so that's just what I've been thinking about what we learn from this time period. Um, is, 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 and when you talk about listening, that's just what's been ringing through my mind. Emily. I've been seeing artists, um, artists who are organizers, who are uh, makers of, of time and space and thought, really organizing in ways toward mutual aid. So seeing Radio Benita organize at Performance Space New York, seeing Rise Indigenous organize on online and via via Instagram, seeing Indigenous Kinship Collective organize mutual aid here and in South, and the ways in which individuals and collectives are listening to listening to the listening to listening to care, listening to ways to care for self and care for one another in a in a in a deeply embedded processional and process oriented way. And I think that this is the kind of work that has always been happening. It has a very specific and a very uh, specific and needed focus right now. But this is the kind of work that needs to be supported. I just, I'm thinking about artists who are listening to this work now and not thinking about or maybe those projects are completely canceled, like the project that goes on maybe what we used to think of as a stage, right? Like, like maybe we're completely listening to the moment and realigning our values of projects. The project is now, the project is what you are engaged in right now. That never needs to come anywhere near a theater. So how does that, but it is art, protest is art, this organizing is art, these signs are art, these essays, these dances people are doing in their living room are art. The way that this work is reverberating and resonating with community in a way that is far beyond how it used to be when the theaters just opened their doors at 7.30 for show time and shut them again at 10. You know, and I know that there's some, some deep discussion about the open your lobby idea, that it's kind of the, the bare minimum, but there's something really beautiful about it in that those doors are open in a different way. And I kind of won't ever want them to close again, <laughs> you know? And I think, I think institutions like, like that, what you said, Camilla, about um, the structure of success, maybe the structure of success for some of these institutions is that they don't reopen. Like, or maybe they don't reopen until they have done some deep reparation work. They have done some deep equity work. They've changed those structures that you were talking about. Like, let's not quit talking about them. Change them and then we'll let you open. There you go. Huh? That's right. I'm, I'm so with you on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just like it. I'm sorry, Chris. But yeah, I mean, you know, and do the real work. I mean, like, listen, I, I think this time period, literally the rug has been pulled out from all of us under and, and, and a forced pause. Um, so, you know, it, it's funny, we, the first couple of weeks of quarantine, if, you know, you'd see these memes going around, like, what you gonna do with your time in quarantine? Are you gonna pick up a skill? Are you gonna learn how to knit? Um, but, but real talk with institutions, what are you gonna do with this time? Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I think it's important as a field, what do we do with this time? How do we really measure success? Um, what do we really, you know, how do we really value um, serving versus conserving or preserving? Mm -hmm. two very different things um, versus being mission focused and not. So 
um, you know, this is time for some real soul searching. And I think those organizations that have done that real work um, and, and, and also not just organizations, I mean, not just put it, organizations, collective, individual artists who've done real work in, in during this time period, um, you know, we should all come out of this anew, um, renewed, looking very vastly differently than we did before. I love this invitation to think about defining success, you know? what are the new metrics for defining success? Then you've already said several of them, both of you, but I wonder like, you know, we have a captive audience of institutions and many other folks, artists and other professionals in the field, but I wonder, yeah, what might be some new metrics of defining success? I, as that question lingers for folks, I mm -hmm. guess I also just want to call, want to think about the funding institutions in this metrics of success and, you know, and recognize, recognize that we're still in this power hierarchy. So maybe there's a way to change that in this metrics of success. And in that, how do we, in this moment of transformation and reckoning, how do we in this performing arts field truly come to terms with the fact that all of the money that supports all of our work comes from foundations that are based on genocide and on the labor of enslaved people. That is where the money that we exist on comes from. And so we, in a way, are complicit. In, and so how, what do I, I don't, I do not know the answer. I do not know the answer as, of systems change. Edgar Villanova does a lot of work on decolonizing wealth and maybe there's some, some work there that can be, that, that we can start to engage in. But how, how are the funders also part of doing this work of radically reimagining? Um, and that, that's, it's going to have to come to them also reckoning where their money comes from. Mm -hmm. We can't ignore that, I don't think. Mm. There's and, and something you've just you know, brought up um, that it has to be done in collaboration. I know there's a, there's a note in the chat also, this idea that yes, system of change cannot be done with institutions devoid of artists, artists devoid of you know, funding metrics, um, funding metrics devoid of board of directors. It has to be a collective um, conversation, which is why I think that this series of conversations that you, uh, you know, that APAP and SOZO has put together is so brilliant because it really does take into account many of the different constituencies that make up our field. Um, because it can't be just done in a vacuum. Otherwise, you know, you, you, you can't just, you know, if the whole body is ill, you can't just fix the finger and think you've done something good because um, the heart is still broken, right? So. This is a huge and intense beginning and opening. Um, one of the things that I love about the four part series that APAP and Sozo Artists has curated is the next conversation a little later this afternoon has some funders on it. And it really, what, what I personally hope as um, one person involved in this complex series of conversations is that this space of dreaming then gets supported and scaffolded by how funders get engaged in the conversation. Um, and then I want to really recognize that this great and intense question that was just brought forward by the two of you, do all the organizations which are currently closed need to reopen? Why? Why not? Um, and that showed up in the chat from Bill Bragan. So in a moment, we're about to transition to our second pair. That might be a question that I circle back to the whole quartet. And lucky you two, you get 25 minutes to really think about your answer to that. <laughs> This has been such a wonderful and beginning, uh, illuminating beginning. I'll see the two of you in a few minutes as we prepare to transition to welcome Sean and Tara. Thank you. All right, friends. So we're gonna continue with another duet conversation and myself supporting that before we circle back to the whole group. Sean Dorsey is joining us, a San Francisco-based choreographer, dancer, writer, educator, activist, person extraordinaire. And Tara Aisha Willis is the Associate Curator of Performance at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, also a gifted and uh, lovely performer in her own right. Um, and so grateful to be in dialogue with the two of you. Thank you so much for joining us. 
I would like to start in the same way that we did with the other two panelists, which is just a way to introduce yourselves. Again, hopefully our viewers had a chance to check out your bios. I'm sure your work precedes both of you, but in case they need a little more, that should be available to them. But I just want to um, sort of recognize our different experiences of the past three months during the pandemic. What have you been focusing on as well? Would you mind sharing your name, pronouns, and anything else in means of introduction that you would like to share? Tara, would you mind going first? Sure. Um, thank you so much to everybody for those, those amazing layers of introduction and um, starting places. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and um, yes, I guess by way of introducing myself, I'll also add that I consider myself a writer and a scholar as well. Um, and thinking about dance in particular and race. Um, and so I think there's so many different perspectives that we're all coming to this conversation with. And, um, you know, I'm trying to personally balance the sort of um, operational and, and conceptual realities of being a, a curator in that role um, and my perspective as an artist in what's going on and, and also sort of stepping back and looking at things from that sort of scholarly vantage point. So um, that will probably be visible in the way I word things. Um, as a sort of forewarning. Um, I have also been focused on over the last few weeks, um, uh, so many things. <laughs> um, I think the biggest one for me has been both on a personal level and sort of inside of my institutional space and other conversations. What is the distance between words and actions? Um, you know, there's so much conversation just right now in the last week that's been brought up around what is the dis difference between, you know, an institutional statement around Black Lives Matter and institutional action. Um, but I think, you know, I'm also trying to take this time, um, though, of course, there's also no time, you <laughs> uh, know, in, in a strange way during COVID as well, um, but to, to, to really also examine um, those gaps between word and action in my own approach to things, um, knowing that I will not be able to narrow the gap in every way at every moment, but um, to really examine them and find them where they are. And I think that's so key to this conversation about the role of institutions as well. Um, you know, it, it's, I think that's sort of fundamental to the conflict that our country is experiencing as well right now. There's so much that, you know, just between, we talked yesterday about like the distance between 2014 um, when Black Lives Matter begins as a movement and now, and what happens in between so much of that is really about, um, you know, so many people being placated by a shift in, you know, to words over actions in so many ways and not feeling moved to act necessarily. Um, and so trying to be really thoughtful and to not sort of rest on, on my personal laurels, um, but also trying to identify where that um, distance between word and action sort of shows up in how institutions are operating um, and what, can, what pieces of that puzzle can be done to shorten the distance. Um, I think that this point about what's happened during COVID and of course the protests um, that our sort of business as usual model has been exposed for what it is, is so important also along those lines that we can sort of understand things. And, you know, again, from my writerly perspective, I can verbalize things till I'm blue in the face, um, but then what really happens? So I think that's, that's the space that my, my brain has been in. Thank you for that introduction and the work you're doing. Sean, hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, my name is Sean Dorsey. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, I don't feel like I have a fabulously organized way to respond to the question of what I've been doing these last few weeks. And I say that because I feel like um, this moment is also providing us the opportunity to um, reflect and examine. I feel like I have been like, uh, someone recently talked about the metrics of what I feel like are white supremacist and ableist um, metrics and measures and value of productivity um, and outcome and product. Um, 
and I really see that in action. Um, I saw that enacted, you know, when we um, began shelter in place. Um, so on one hand, I feel like it's been a real time for me of uh, deep listening and reflection. It's also been a time of a lot of fear and anxiety, um, leading a trans-centered organization. Um, I loved what Camilla articulated um, about holding both stillness and force. Um, I love those words and I feel like those are things I've been sitting with. Um, I haven't frankly been able to have a whole lot of stillness <laughs> I aspire to. Um, I'm, I'm trying to embrace force and boldness around um, my voice as a white person in leadership in the field, my voice as a white trans person in leadership in the field. Um, and I think for me, the biggest thing has for this time, it's been about relationship and not content. There's been so much um, push, I feel like, from outward communication in our field um, around producing content um, versus kind of being a relationship. Um, so for me, this time has really been about um, my immediate concentric circles of relationship, most connected to least connected, um, and thinking about how my response um, you know, three months ago as an arts leader to COVID-19 really needed to activate and reflect my values and my organization's values. Um, so I love also something was said recently about um, how, like how I see primarily white run and non-disabled run facilities using this time of um, COVID-19 related facility shutdown to like refinish the floors or paint all the walls, which we're literally seeing instead of instituting ongoing um, practices to dismantle white supremacist culture or practices within the institution without using that time and money to, um, to create more access for wheelchair users and scooter users, folks who are deaf and hard of hearing or creating all gender bathrooms, et cetera. So um, I love this question about don't reopen or maybe not reopen or don't reopen until you've done some of this work doing the real work. Um, so yeah, I think that's my answer to that question. That's so great, thank you. Um, and I think some of our dialogue now will help pull out some of those strands. Um, everyone that's engaged right now, I want to recognize these incredible questions that are coming up around in the chat, this question of will they reopen? And I think we will dig into that. Um, I'm going to hold on that for a moment, but we will absolutely address that because I think it's a really important and pertinent question. And these other ideas that stem from that around equity and who has the capacity to sustain through this time and who has the reserves. These are very, very real questions and concerns that I think we all have, um, as well as radical ideas that it might actually be a good thing to address who's in the field as we move forward. Um, but before we get into that, two things that just came up in um, both of your introductions had to do with, um, to use Tara's words, the gap between statement and action words in action, and then also accessibility in a, in a wide range of ways. Um, I'm going to start with the gap. Um, and so I'm sort of curious, historically, we can look back and see this art often has an important and pivotal, sometimes central role in social transformation, but that requires action. Um, and so I wonder, you know, what are things that you see and recognizing that 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 is the hard work, right? How do I move from statement into action? What are some things you see happening that you would like to lift up and highlight that bridge that gap between statement and action? Or what are ways that you dream of it happening? Tara, I'm going to go to you first, just because you kind of brought those words into our vernacular today. Yeah, um, I think one piece of this is, is actually something that's already come up is this idea of listening and I want to add to that hearing <laughs> because um, the gap between words and actions also starts to close, you know, if we're not just reacting, but actually hearing what's being said to us um, as an institution or an individual alike, you know, there's so many folks right now who are sort of reevaluating their understanding of racial dynamics. Um, of, of their own whiteness, of their institution's whiteness, et cetera. Um, and 
so, so, you know, it's not just listening, it's actually hearing. So I guess my, I don't, um, off the top of my head, I'm, this is not a necessarily a, uh, that they're not, are not excellent examples, but I am not currently seeing them. So please, please send me links if you know of them. But I would love to see, um, you know, mechanisms for listening and hearing being sort of built into institutions. I don't know what those necessarily look like. And actually, I think that is the point is that we still have to figure out what they are in a lot of ways. And um, this is a, this is a long, long road we're on and many of us have been on it for a long, long time already. And so, um, you know, welcome <laughs> if you haven't been, but also um, it's gonna be trial and error. So, you know, um, so that, that's, that's just one addition to this, this point about really, really listening to artists, to um, staff who are perhaps not the highest in the hierarchy, um, finding internal and external modes of listening and hearing. Um, and also, um, you know, figuring out how, you know, like we're all already late to the party, right? So like, what can, <laughs> what do we do next now that we're in the door? is the thing that matters more so than how late was that other person compared to how late I am? And what did you bring to the party? So also really finding, um, really taking the time to evaluate or reevaluate or interrogate really proactively what you can bring to the party, you know? Um, what tools do, does the institution you work for all, and I think this is sort of speaking to that question perhaps about like who should reopen, um, like, there are things that, that many of these institutions are really good at, actually. It's just that they haven't perhaps applied those tools or skills in certain ways. Um, and so these are, I think, are all the thinking that we need to be doing right now to, to narrow that gap um, between words and actions. Because we can, I mean, we all know there are beautiful mission statements out there, right? Um, and there are lots of commitments that I'm really thankful are happening to taking action. And a lot of those commitments include saying, I don't actually know what the action is yet, but we're going to work to find out, you know. Um, but it's also, you know, it's not necessarily completely about transforming your institution or closing it. It's also about identifying what you do have in your toolkit and um, how you could perhaps reorient it or, um, you know, also collaborate with other institutions, et cetera, to share those resources and actually not just look at it as this constant sort of battle between institutions, you know, I mean, we're seeing that with just the digital platforms right now. If, if I, as MCA Chicago, co-present an artist with another institution, it's not a tour right now. It's a shared digital platform. So these ideas of whose terrain is whose actually are really being exposed right now for what they are. Um, so we all have some tools to bring to the party, you know, is yours a cake, is mine a, you know, a, a side dish, like, let's figure out what those are and do the work to also be able to deploy them in the way that will shorten that gap. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I do notice that in the chat, some folks have started to post some links of resources per the call out that you just made, like, where are the places? So Scott Stoner posted a link uh, to Future Architects and Tanya Marquardt posted about a self-care resource that she's found particularly um, helpful at this time. Um, please continue to share those resources. Sean, do you have some thoughts about that? Ways that you have seen or hope to see that we can move more to action or just responses to Tara's thoughtful words? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thinking about that gap um, and maybe a lot of white people in leadership, um, cisgender people in leadership, non-disabled people in leadership being like, how do we get there? How do I move into that gap space? And um, I like to quote Madison Cario, uh, a great arts leader who um, I heard say, your budget is a moral document. And I love that. Um, and I would add your season program brochure is a moral document. Your payroll register in terms of who is on your payroll and who's paid most to least is a moral document. Um, your website right now in terms of all the content you're reposting and all the artists you're putting on your website um, who are probably unpaid frankly for um, 
you uh, benefiting from their labor is a moral document. So um, I just echo that it's really easy for our organizations to create statements of solidarity or for us white people to wear a Black Lives Matter t-shirt or folks to change their profile picture. But um, I think this is a moment for us to invite and challenge each other that these values are completely meaningless unless there are dollars and actions and systems of power um, behind them. Um, so, um, one thing I would love to invite conversation around in this moment is an opportunity, I hope, for us to um, interrogate, examine, and I would hope discard the DEI model of change um, in favor of perhaps other justice-based models of change. Um, I feel like, um, DEI, you know, is largely um, a white-led, white-conceived system of, quote, change that is often self-congratulatory for us. It can be very self-soothing for us um, and is generally non-threatening to systems of power. Um, the, the model of diversity, um, as I heard Maureen Knighton uh, say recently, is about optics and not about changing power. Um, it's about like, let's get one of those on our board or no, we already, we already had a trans last year in our season program. Um, inclusion is, um, is a, I think is a, is operationalized violence. It's about absorbing people into existing structures that harm them. Um, I will quote uh, an amazing artist, Jay Mace III, a black trans queer artist who says, when I hear the word inclusion, I hear white folks wanting black people to disappear into their organizations and their dreams, instead of understanding that black people have a right to autonomy and mutually beneficial collaboration. That's Jay Mace III. Um, and when I think about the model of equity, I think of it kind of like this, you know, all right, you know, it feels very close to the idea of equality to me. Um, so I think so many of us um, in this moment are talking about not wanting equity, wanting justice, um, and that there, there is potentially more space in conversations about models of justice, where there is room for recognizing and acknowledging and being accountable for um, harm and trauma and for conversations and instituting practices and actual um, forms of reparations and so on. Um, so I just would, I would love for our field to really um, interrogate DEI as, um, as a model. And I think in this moment, it would be great for us. I feel like DEI is going to like slow us down by 20 years getting toward justice and starting to dismantle systems and cultures of white supremacy and um, the fact that pretty much everybody who holds power in the dance field is cisgender um, and most of our institutions are led by non-disabled people. Um, anyway, so I, 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 do have, I have no answer. I do not have the answer here, but I'm excited for us to leapfrog over DEI and, and get to, um, to, uh, to other practices. In the spirit of the gap between words and actions and some things that I've seen that um, I'm inspired by, one of which um, I think you were, I know Tara was involved in, which was the Creating New Futures document that's been circling that was artist driven and presenter support uh, influenced and funder supported and is an interrogation of, you know, and in response to Emily was very involved in it as well, our other panelists, an interrogation of cancellations that had happened um, a lack of a moral compass perhaps that had been guiding some of the communication, not even the fees, but the communication that had happened with that. And so artists got together and started something and I've been amazed, not just by the um, work itself, but how people convened around that. And that's been inspiring to me and something I wanna lift up if you're not aware of it. I know a lot is happening in the chat and I know a lot of folks involved in it are in the chat. If you wouldn't mind posting that into the chat to make sure everybody's aware of it, I would appreciate it. And then um, a recent solidarity statement that came out that I felt that um, really had a lot of action in it was Jacob's Pillow statement. It was released on Friday um, and just, you know, recognized, um, I recognize the complexity of these statements having had to 
not had to, having had the privilege to write one um, with collaboration from our board chair and other folks at Dance Place, we wanted to move quickly. And it's also difficult to move quickly and thoughtfully, just a truth. And also maybe it's good to fail forward and get something out and get the clap back and the interrogation that's needed with that. You know, that will help us learn and do better, all of us. Um, so there's a lot of different opinions and layers and complexity around that. But um, just one that I thought was really backed up with, um, I think you said dollars and something else, Sean. Um, dollars and programming, maybe. <laughs> Sorry, you're on mute. Sorry, I was muted. Um, systems of power also. Yes. And, and just, yeah, how do we balance that? Thanks so much for Laura Colby posting that into the chat. Much appreciated. And Yanira Castro both did great work on that, um, creating new futures document. So um, a really great question come up, came up um, from an anonymous attendee. And it has to do with how this time is affecting young artists and arts professionals. And I want to bring it forward now. Um, spoiler alert, you two are going to have to address this intense question about who closes, who opens, who remains. We'll do that in the group forum in a little bit. Give you time to stew on that one. But yeah, just wondering, you know, how young artists and arts professionals who might be watching that have already severely suffered from the competitive and economically fragile field that we were already immersed in. Um, any thoughts or advice about how young people might deal with the reality that the performing arts is going to come back in a different way? Have you had Thoughts about that? I know you both to be involved as mentors with some folks in different kinds of ways. Um, anything coming to mind for you? Sean? Um, I think my most honest answer to that, I don't think it's really an answer. My, my most honest response is that um, the young people who I may be in relationship with or my organization may be in relationship are um, of communities that are completely ignored by our field to begin with. So in many ways, not a lot has changed um, for these young people. So um, my hope would be that leadership in our field um, will um, show up with an, an offer of dollars and systems and power and resources for these young people. That's not useful advice and perhaps is still in the like pipe dream <laughs> location of my brain. But um, I just acknowledge like how many, uh, and this is not just specific to young and younger people, but um, how so many communities of all ages of black trans women, black trans people, indigenous and two-spirit trans people, uh, people of color who are trans and gender non-conforming, um, disabled trans and queer people of color, um, mostly are just totally uh, bypassed um, by our entire field in terms of investment of meaningful um, opportunities for creative expression and cultural leadership. So none of that has been changed by this moment yet. And I hope that there will be some response, um, meaningful onward shortening of the gap, interventions towards shortening the gap. Um, but there's, yeah, there's just, a, there's just an ongoing failure by our field to, um, to step up and invest in and, and be led by so many communities. That's not an answer. I'm sorry, it's response. That's okay, it's response. Tara, any thoughts from you? It's a tough question. Yeah, um, in a way, I think it's actually quite beautiful to be sort of entering the field at this moment. Um, terrifying, obviously, and this does not account for the very real financial and um, physical um, realities of what's happening, but we're also in a moment of reworking that should have already happened. So I actually don't see it. I mean, I, I have been there and very recently, I'm <laughs> young myself in many ways, um, but in that space of like being so excited and looking up to so many people for such a long time and to, you know, perhaps so many of us being in the arts are sort of finally having found our community um, or our network that really feels supportive of our particular particularities, um, put it that way. Uh, 
but the space was already wrong. So I actually um, really struggle with this idea of the loss of something that um, we're supposed to be able to re return to. Um, you know, again, we all have to really deal with, there's so much mourning that I've been doing as well. And I've come to this point, that's not how I felt, you know, on March 13th, but um, I'm, I'm seeing so many powerful ways that young people can actually um, have a, a relationship with a new kind of field. Um, and I think that it's, um, we're in one of those pivotal moments. These have happened in American history before where young people are actually leading the change that's happening in the country. Why not also in the arts um, and in performance? So, um, you know, again, that doesn't change the fact that the infrastructure is not necessarily there to support those folks. But again, this image of the party, right? Um, we're all already late, you know, um, so many of us, including black folks who have internalized a bunch of, you know, BS are already late to the party. Um, because our field is already late, because we're on stolen land. Like there's already so many degrees of lateness. So enter where you can, you know, like assume you are already defensive about something you might not need to be, you know, assume you're late and should still step forward through the door. Um, you know, assume that this is not an, whatever incident has occurred is not a standalone incident. It's grounded on a bunch of other stuff. And the folks telling you, this incident was bad are not actually just talking about that incident. They're talking about something that goes beyond that. That's much deeper. That's historic. Um, and that you might be part of, you know, assume that there's something deeper going on. Um, so there's, you know, and I take those assumptions not as a negative stance, but actually as a, as full of potential, because I think there have not yet been so many people paying attention to their own assumptions at once in my lifetime, at least short as it may be. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm suspicious, for example, of folks, I was watching George Floyd's um, home going yesterday, uh, in those moments where people sort of take this really optimistic, like, we're going to change this in our lifetimes, you know, make those statements. But I actually have come to see those as a sort of performative in the effective sense of performative. This is a statement that actually does something beyond what the statement is saying, right? This is about suspending our disbelief so that we can step forward. So, um, you know, I say assume the worst in a way, but assume the worst and then take a step because there's going to be criticism no matter what you do. So this hesitance about taking a step, you know, like, let's just take it and then get it, you know. And so that, I guess, in a way that's, I, I started with young artists and maybe that's all expanded to institutions and to all of us as individuals as well. But um, I think it's such a powerful moment. So in a way, I would say, you know, congratulations to those young artists. And I want to honor those feelings of loss and grievance. FOMO is so real. Um, so like totally honor that. Um, I think we're all feeling that. We've all had performances we were so invested in and excited about partnerships, collaborations. And so to leave yourself the space for that is a human and important thing to do. And then to also see this beautiful opportunity. Um, I would encourage anyone who is sort of feeling this to attend the conversation tomorrow. And um, I'm gonna lean into my APAP friends that are on to make sure that they post this. The one that's looking at this with a historical lens, how did we get to this moment in time? Something that I've leaned into to try and maintain my sense of perspective and optimism is to think about the culture wars of the early 90s and how that decimated what we then knew at that time as a National Endowment for the Arts and created a whole new possibility. It took time. It took years. Um, artists on this call have very much benefited from the creation of the regional arts networks, the New England Foundation for the Performing Arts, excuse me, the New England Foundation for, their, for the Arts and their National Dance Project and National Theater Project, for example. That was something that was an innovation out of another crisis time. So to young folks watching, I would say, tune into that conversation tomorrow because I think it'll bring some of that bigger picture lens that might be useful and helpful and that we can't yet see the solutions that will come. This conversation is part of that and a stepping stone towards that. And so are you, you are the solutions. As Tara just so beautifully said, young people are leading revolutions in so many ways, lead the revolution in the arts field. So, um, if you don't mind, y'all, I'm going to welcome back our other panelists and go into a melee of all five of us getting in it together. We have a big question to discuss. <laughs>
Welcome back, Emily. Welcome back, Camilla. Um, this is a beautiful group of folks. I feel very honored to be in conversation with you all. Thank you for taking time to be with us. There's been some really great conversation in some of the chat. I'm multitasking a little bit, so I haven't seen it all. Apologies, viewers that are missing it. But there's a lot of questions about this great thing that just opened up. What if everyone doesn't come back? What does it take to come back? And not just the logistics of science and health and safety, but what could be a meaningful reentry to the field? Questions of accessibility have come up, and that means many things to many different folks. Um, questions of accountability, both from the funder's perspective and from the institution. Questions of how our presentations, our curriculum, our budgets, our moral documents. These are really important questions to dig into. So I wonder, um, I'm going to circle back to the folks that have had a little time to think about this for a moment. Emily and Camilla first, just to kind of get us back into that. Tell me more about this idea. What if all places don't reopen. What does that look like? Emily, you're nodding so emphatically. I'm going to go to you with that emphatic nod. Well, you know, I think, and it's, it's interesting in the chat, yes. I think that there's been some chatter about, you know, where does that leave the middle ground organizations? And I think the statement about all places come, not coming back is a real statement to force all stakeholders to truly re-examine their mission, to truly re-examine on a very cellular level who they're serving, um, and 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 a very radical level who they're serving. Um, you know, I we at the Apollo. One thing I'm, I'm I'm very conscious about is around our mission. Our mission is to create safe space for Black artists, Black audiences. We are a safe space. Um, we are in this conversation right now around sort of Black Lives Matter, safe physical space in our streets. Well, we see that also translated in our arts institutions. Where are those institutions where artists feel safe to speak up, to bring their whole selves forward, to um, truly present their whole selves forward and with not the fear of a, of a presenter saying, mm, I don't know about that piece, um, to placate their voice, to placate their art, to fit themselves into a box um, in order to just maintain a career as an artist. Um, and, and, and so, you know, we really have to re-examine mission. So if we're saying that we're artist-driven organization, for which artists and who are we serving? Um, and, and, you know, I, 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 so, I, so I think when, when you re-examine, right, about coming back, how are you coming back fully? Um, if, and, and, and really putting your, putting your mission, putting your systems where your mouth is, quite frankly. Yeah. Absolutely agree. And maybe in this process, in this process of thinking, you know, transformation is not an easy process. Transformation in transformation, some things do not continue. That is part of transformation. And so I think that this thought and this really, really delving into this thought of what of what institutions do come back is is critical, is crucial, is a place of power with for artists to be part of that conversation. We have institutions and we have presenters who are racist, who are anti-Black, who are transphobic, who are homophobic, who do not have space, not only physical space, but all of, the, all of what space means for artists with disabilities. If, if you as a leader of a cultural institution and if your institution is not centering Black and Indigenous and other artists of color and artists and queer and trans artists and artists with disabilities, then you, um, then you are not doing the work. And I think there might be a way in which the field as a whole can 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 see that and can can say that and can notice that. And I love what Tara said about uh, there are so many degrees of lateness. We do recognize that there are so many degrees of lateness and enter where you are. And so yes, there is an entry point of doing this work, but we're also at this critical juncture where we understand what the real work is and what performed work is. And so if some of these, I think many of the smaller and mid-sized organizations are the ones who are doing that work, who have been doing that work, some of the larger institutions have not, do not do that work. What if, if some of those don't reopen? What if we start to create UBI for artists? What if we start to create healthcare for artists? What if that money that goes, that those 
dollars that go to those institutions that uphold values that none of us here are talking, none of us here are in alignment with, if they are not in alignment with our values, we can shift that resource to, to artists, um, to mutual aid, to the organizations that are doing that work, and we can really transform this, this process together. So I, I kind of think of it as a, as, a, as a positive, and how can we maybe as a field think of it as a positive? Um, thank you for sort of focusing the conversation a little more deeply to really think about, you know, what is the moral imperative here? Who are the partners that we want to have with us as we step into these challenging moments to create this optimistic new future? How do we center Black Lives Matter? How do we center Indigenous folks? How do we address the great inequities around um, access to our physical spaces and the, the abilities that uh, everyone brings into those conversations? How do we create better access for those that are deaf and hard of hearing? How do we equalize all of these um, things? Um, Tara, Sean, do you want to join in on this? Thoughts about, you know, what happens if not everyone reopens? I'm really interested in this idea of large and small and midsize. Um, Earlier in the conversation, Camila had mentioned nimble and a different kind of muscle that's required to be responsive. And sometimes when an institution is so large, they, it's difficult to be nimble and responsive. It's a size issue in a way, like they can't lumber through these changes deftly and quickly. Maybe they can, we've seen our government make some very fast changes recently. So who knows? But I wonder if that's part of the conversation too, because there were concerns that came up in the chat about, you know, there are small organizations that may not be able to just logistically and financially weather this time. And that's a huge concern. And many of them might be black led, native led, uh, Latinx led, trans led because of a lack of resources. Tough stuff here. But if we value, if those are the institutions that we value, those are the institutions we have to protect. So I think that's on us to protect those institutions that we know we need. Mm -hmm. Would you define us in this moment for you? I think us, meaning <laughs> this field, meaning artists, meaning audiences. How do we have audiences engaged in these conversations? Meaning presenters, meaning funders, meaning those of us who are part of the makeup um, of, of creating, of creating and, and creating and sharing and offering uh, performing arts. You know, I, I know it's good to be very specific, but this does create, this does require, I think all of us um, working collaboratively um, to make this, to make this change, just as defunding police and abolition requires everyone to be on those paths and on the streets in whatever form that you can be. This does require all of us um, figuring out how. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it takes the we to make this kind of change. Something um, I, I am interested in seeing is um, greater systems of transparency and accountability um, in terms of the, the funding world and grant makers um, as one step to address, Tara, the gap you talk about, um, I think that we all know about the, you know, as long as, as long as our field has existed, white led organizations naming black artists um artists of color and grant applications i know certainly as a white trans artist i've i've found out secretly i've been included in many grant applications i was never invited to be a part of projects for um but that gap between stated values and um you know audience outreach efforts meaning just free blocks of tickets given out you know um but, but asking funders to um, really demand transparency and accountability so that when people in leadership say we're doing the work, we're asked to show it. Um, and that, 
you know, collecting demographics as part of a grant application um, needs to have some actual um, consequential meaning. So if a funder collects demographic information and a staff is all white or a vast majority white or a board is vast, you know, vast majority white, um, if there aren't black, indigenous, people of color, disabled folks, trans folks in meaningful leadership positions, that needs to be the first question on a funder's mind and not kind of the like, um, so that, that to me is very linked to like what, in terms of large institutions reopening and the, the long time massive um, city, state, national government and foundational um, subsidies, you know, that um, are, are, taken, are kind of a given for mostly white-led, cis-led, non-disabled-led organizations really being examined. Um, yeah, transparency, accountability, consequences. Tara? Yeah, I mean, the, for me, part of the bottom line is also that there are um, so, I mean, capitalism, <laughs> like, you know, there are so many, you know, I hear this um, really beautiful thing that Emily just said about like, how do, it's a redistributing of, of wealth, literally, right? So um, th there's also individuals working in these institutions who are, you know, doing their best in a really terrible situation in a lot of cases, but also like, you know, this, this desire to keep a job or to, you know, have sustainability in a system which of course has been very um, revealed if it wasn't already obvious to you by COVID that does not stand up um, in and of itself aside, you know, beyond the art sector, the crucialness of having those resources is so like, you know, it's just laden with desperation to be honest. So, I, I mean, I don't have an answer to that but it's just a thing that I think so many people are feeling right now. I, you know, the frustration that I'm hearing from arts administrators in all kinds of institutions about whatever issue they already may have had um, and how it's exacerbated during this time um, or how there's a feeling of not being able to escape out of fear that you'll not have access to another job. So I, I say all that not to deflect from it, but I really would love to figure out what the concrete ways we can sort of, um, you know, deal with that that proposition of like actually redistributing, you know, and maybe it's in this finding collaborations, uh, finding those individuals, you know, in those institutions who will work in some way, and it may be small for a time, or finding collaborations across institutions, you know. Um, I think there's a, a swath of what might be called mid sized institutions where there's sort of a bridging of these kinds of ethics, where there's some of both <laughs> going on. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't think institutions are the solution in general, but they're the, they're the and I include myself as someone who works at one, um, you know, the, the holders of the keys at the moment. Um, uh, I'm also thinking a lot about, and of course I'm in an, a museum, so, you know, looking at my institution, but also peers who are in museum contexts where performance is not the only thing that we do. Um, there's a, uh, reliance on the programming, on the artists, and by extension, in many cases, the curators or the creators of the programs who are often not actually the leadership of the institution um, to solve this problem, to be the space where the conversation with the public happens, to, um, you know, like, we're, there's a lot of conversations going on about are we platforming the voices that matter to people right now as if they haven't already mattered for so many people for like ages, but there's that um, problem. Are we platforming people or are we speaking as an authority or how do we locate ourselves in this like authoritative voice, you know, and really the, um, there's, I don't know that there's, that binary is kind of useless at the moment and really always has been, but it's the one that so many institutions operate in of like, either we have to, you know, shove someone else in front of us <laughs> essentially. Um, but at the same time, of course, it's such an important strategy to bring in an outside voice to um, moderate, like literally moderate discussions, but also to, you know, uh, work with institutions in so many cases that can't see their own eyelashes. So 
it's I'm, I don't again no answers there but I'm I'm thinking about the dangers of that where you know we know so many of us you know I think everyone on this panel and so many of us on this call probably know that there are tons of artists who have been working on these questions already <laughs> like this is not and, and we know also that programming um, you know, like someone in the chat was saying, you know, that thing that happens where you only program black people in, in February, right? Um, that uh, doesn't solve the problem, nor does staff leadership of color necessarily, you know, again, this point about inclusion, right? It doesn't necessarily make that voice more powerful in the room. And also people have internalized their own stuff. So uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm just personally sort of struggling with all of these um, these sort of intricacies of of like actually how do we proactively um, find an, a, a step to take um, outside of our sort of institutional spaces or our sort of uh, personal networks um, of artists, et cetera. Yeah, and, and I do think that the Creating New Futures document is one step in that direction. There's others. I'm loving all of the links people are posting to sort of these Black dance conversations that have been happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's a great kind of segue to our into just more directly addressing these challenges of box ticking, right? I've got my one trans, my one Native person, my one uh, physically integrated dance company, and I've got um, some Black dance, and now the rest of the program is going to be white centered. Um, and so, you know, how do we, I know each of you in slightly different ways, but Sean and Emily in particular, I know as folks that I think of as really embracing an inviting in rather than a calling out um, way of working, the building partnerships with institutions that affect change within the institution while doing your artwork. What are some ways in your experiences, and I welcome other um, panelists to share too, but I just want to start with you because I know of direct ways you've done this. What are some ways that you've built those relationships or just direct tools of really a conversion process of an embracing a partner to take what they perceive to be a scary and risky journey? And that may not be true, but I think there is some fear involved in those um, problematic program programming decisions. Do either of you have some things to reflect on with that? Emily, I see a big nod. Thinking, yeah, yeah, it's a big one. I mean, I, I'm trying to think of a very specific example because of my work in general and inherently and explicitly uh, is, is decolonial work and is work that is in relation to place and people. And so when I'm working with an organization, when I'm partnering with an organization, we are, I try to create a space in which we are working in an equitable, um, uh, so for sure, in shore, for example, this work, it had a performance, it had a feast, it had days of volunteer work in the community led by the visioning of community members and it had uh, storytelling, a day of stories uh, led by indigenous leaders. And so in, in the process of presenting this work called Shore, you have a theater that's holding the, the, the dance part or the, the show, but you have these other elements, the feasting, the stories, the work in the world that are equally as important. And they happen on separate days. An audience can come to any number of them. They can come to all of them. Each one of those parts requires multiple organizational and community-based partners. And I had many conversations with some of the organization, the uh, theater organizations about equity. So maybe this community organization is bringing 50 volunteers. To me, that's an equal partner to the theater who's offering X amount of dollars. And so how do we work equitably within these decolonizing or process of decolonizing or you've been thinking about decolonizing um, systems so that so that the the things that people want to do together and the ways in which we can collectively vision or rest or eat or make food or watch a show or listen to a story or generate change, that those are the things that are centered. Um, and to, and that even puts me like in, in those situations, I'm, I'm one of the many offering 
that 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 process of shore, for example. Um, and I think, but on another specific note, there have been times where the work of decolonization, the work of even the first step of a land acknowledgement that I require an organization to start to take a step toward in an effort toward decolonization and centering uh, Black and Indigenous and other artists of color, sometimes organizations are very afraid of that. And um, I think one way, and this came out of creating new futures, one way to kind of address some of this, some of this is, are there um, intersectional writers that artists agree to, that we all agree that we will only work in spaces that are doing the work of decolonization, of centering Black lives, of making their spaces accessible. Um, of, of an environment writers, for example, too, like all of the things that we value, how do, how do we um, uh, organize around those values, I guess. Um, so I don't know if that answered the question, but those are some of the things that it made me think of. That's great. Thank you, Sean, about partnership with institutions to help shift the needle. Um, <laughs> Yes, but now I find myself shifting and wanting to say yes, exclamation mark to what Emily just said and what an opportunity this would be for um, more resourced institutions and funders in this moment to um, for us to gather and um, pay for the labor of artist leaders, artist activist leaders to create across the field, a living document, uh, much like the amazing living document that's been worked on by a lot of leadership, including Utara, around this idea of, as you said, like an intersectional writer. Um, something I do, I, I have in my tech writer, um, lots of things you know, that include like, the theater has to change their recorded announcement if it says, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, because that doesn't welcome me and it doesn't welcome a whole lot of my audience. Um, or, you know, um, bathrooms and changing room in workshop spaces. We never use dance studios because those studios are extremely unsafe and unwelcoming for many of my communities. But if we ever do one day move into doing more of our community workshops in dance studio spaces, there would be a tech writer requirement that there are images on the walls of um, more than just skinny, white, able-bodied, um, you know, dancing bodies. Anyway, I am excited about this possibility of this moment, folks being supported and resourced. There are so many people in the field who have and are working with these writers, like you are, Emily, like my company does. And I dream of, my dream space is how great if we could connect and be supported in this moment, because it needs to be, um, you know, for me and the writer I have, I would love to see cisgender people you know, super mainstream cisgender ballet companies demanding these same practices so that trans and gender nonconforming communities are safer to come into those spaces. So anyway, that's just a dream space. Are there ways that we could support each other and ask for support from the field to connect? Um, and that feels like a really actionable thing that also then really highlights those institutions that are not willing to embrace those practices. And that to me is a question about who in the field is supported to continue or, or not. Thank you, Sean. Um, there's some really hot things happening in the chat. And so we are nearly out of time, but to conclude our time, and these conversations will be continuing throughout the break room series, but to conclude our time, I wanted to, we just heard from Emily and Sean, I wanted to finish with Tara and Camila to just really respond to this call out that we need to be centering blackness, specifically blackness um, in these conversations for effective change. Camila, you have a smile and you're unmuted. Would you jump in? You know, I was honestly just smiling. Um, so thank you, Denise Saunders Thompson for that. Um, and, and, and yes, I do believe that's what this time is, is, is calling for, um, and, and which is what I was intimating, this idea of safety, but also is this idea of centering identity um, and centering Blackness. You know, this is, um, um, I feel strongly about it, my organization, this is what my work, my personal um, work in philosophy and pedagogy does on the 365 days, but also my institution. Um, there are only a handful of institutions that are focused towards centering blackness, right? There are only a handful. How many black presenting organizations can we name on this call? 
Okay, so there we go, right? Very few. Um, that's a problem. Um, and I also don't think that it's just on the Black institutions to center Blackness. Centering Blackness is not just done with who you present on your stage. It's who sits in your boardroom. It's who's running your institution. It's who's sitting in your administrative staff. It is who you are calling out as your core base audience. It requires a great deal of work. Um, and, and, it's, and, and programming is not just where you cut it. Um, because, you know, um, decisions are made about how work is presented, how it's contextualized and framed, how artists are supported and contextualized and framed, that is also centering Blackness. So there is a lot of work that I think as a field we have to do. I think this moment is absolutely a wake-up call for the field at large and where we are playing our part in that, um, in that very conversation. Um, so I, that's, that's all I have to say. Yeah, hard to follow that. Thank you, Camila. <laughs> That's everything, everything you said, except for my institution is not focused on Blackness and Black artists and Black uh, communities and audiences and staff. Um, and so, but I want to point out also that, you know, again, those of us that have been thinking about this constantly know that there are tons of institutions in that map you just painted for us who are publicly putting forward even a majority of black artists, but not actually making those changes in their staff and boards who are aiming for black audiences with a lot of their programs, but not actually making those changes in their staff and boards who are not interrogating the actual experience of coming into their building for a black person on the most basic levels, um, you know, et cetera. I mean, the list goes on. So I, there's also that middle, it's, it's I wanna add that it's not just folks are not paying attention at all, or folks have been dedicated this to this for decades, if not hundreds of years. Um, so there's also this very frustrating middle ground. Um, and I think that's also a space that a lot of uh, institutions are getting, you know, called out for right now. Um, and again, it's late, right? It's already too late. Um, the something I've been saying for a long time in terms of my own approach to programming is that you know, all the curators in the country, <laughs> the programmers in the country would need to program a majority of black artists um, and um, as well POC artists for hundreds of years for this to actually fully transform because it's also about transforming societal expectations, mentalities. Um, it's also about transforming what's normal or assumed to be business as usual. Um, and so I'm extending that to staff, to boards, to leadership, to front of house, you know, um, the greeting that you get when you enter a building. And, you know, that's partly because, like we've been talking about, programming doesn't do it. Um, it's also about processes. You know, we talked about justice um, as a way to, re, you know, a justice-oriented approach as a way to, re, or, to sort of re- work ourselves from sort of DEI inclusion oriented. Um, and to me what that is, and I'm not an expert on these modes of, of operating, um, but, I, but to me what that also indicates, aside from many things that we've already mentioned and, and that we haven't, is also that it's about process. It's about being in an interaction and dealing with something and knowing that it's not gonna be solved by one conversation. Um, it's about continuing to reevaluate and revisit as opposed to just saying, here's the task we need to do, and once our staff looks like X, we're done. It's also like, there are, you could, ha you could do that staff transformation, and the processes through which you get a project approved, through which you, you know, make a board decision will still be drenched in this old BS. So, um, you know, if people don't feel empowered to change it, um, or if you're just inheriting things and try, you know, again, we've talked about this sort of capitalist drive that we're all experiencing this like weird lag around right now. If you, you know, are constantly doing triage and trying to get the programming done and trying to plan for the future all at once, you know, it's very hard to reevaluate those things. So I really think the issues are, are all interconnected and also Black Lives must be centered. I completely agree. Thank you for bringing it up um, over and over and over in the conversation in the chat, Denise. Um, yeah. Friends, all of us tuning in and watching, there's another conversation about to begin in 25 minutes. I have a feeling that this will influence that conversation. I hope it does. 
I fully recognize that this conversation is just a beginning. And also, it's one of many conversations that have been happening for a long time. And a lot of folks, both who I can see on my screen and who I can see in the chat, have been engaged in that labor for far too long. So I honor and recognize that. Um, sorry, the next conversation is at 3.30. Thank you, Krista, for that correction. I think we'll need the break. Um, to take care before we re-enter. Um, a really, so many important issues were brought up in the chat and it was impossible to get to them all. Thank you, Denise Saunders Thompson for pushing us into this, uh, pushing me into this. Seen, heard, recognized, owning it, needed to go in more fully. Um, and then a great conversation was also brought up from um, Karen Stein about the uniqueness of being in a rural um, location and the work that she's doing, check it out in the chat. I think it's something that we can all continue to engage in. And it makes me think of something that I often um, share with folks in different ways. And I'm gonna use that to wrap us up and then get a little one word sentiment from each panelist to, wrap, to truly finish. And thanks Krista for joining for that. The sentiment that I was about to share is that, you know, real lasting and effective change in my humble opinion takes many, many ways of working. It takes someone setting something on fire. It takes an infiltrator going into institutions and changing them. It takes someone practicing self-care and working quietly and having intimate moments and difficult conversations with loved ones. It takes the whole spectrum. And so within this conversation, um, there has been a range of things that hopefully help to start this provocative question, what is our new future? And fully recognize it's just the iceberg of that. As a parting way, and then Krista is gonna wrap us all up fully, is if each panelist could just say something very specific that you hope to see in the new, fu in, in the new future, a real tangible thing that you hope to see. I'm going to say one because we're working on it on Dance Place and I don't want the person on this call to have to say it. I hope to see gender inclusive bathrooms in all venues. Um, Tara, you look like you're, yes, stepping in. Um, underscoring this point about um, equity writers, I would love to see institutions actually bring that to the table. Um, and come to the table with artists who indeed in many cases may not be thinking in this way themselves <laughs> um, with um, standards, with ethical standards that are actually, you know, spreading this beyond um, even just putting it on the artist's plate completely. Another tangible takeaway. Emily, thank you. I would like to see the majority of our institutions be led by Black and Indigenous and other people of color. And um, yeah, so that that is the majority that we're working within. Heard. Sean? I would like to see um, in the funding space um, that at least Night, at least 90% of a funding docket be um, investing in institutions that are led by uh, and for Black leadership, people of color leadership, Indigenous leadership, at least 90%. Camila, take us home. I'd like to see safe Black spaces. Panelists, thank you for your incredible thoughtfulness, your bravery and your willingness to go in and to constantly pivot quickly in this conversation that was so robust and informed by all of the viewers in the chat. Krista. Wow. <laughs> thank you so much, um, all of you and all of you that were in the chat. Um, I think that we definitely need a snap function in Zoom and we're gonna advocate for that. Um, we come to the end of session one and just want to thank uh, Christopher and Tara and Sean and Emily and all of the people working in the background um, and Camila. Um, thank you for all your work. The session was recorded and will be posted on the APAP website in the next few days for future viewing along with a full transcript of the conversation and the chat box. Uh, each session's recording is also immediately available right now for you to watch and to share from APAP's Facebook page. APAP looks forward to following up with resources and efforts inspired by today's conversation and the chat and the many questions that we didn't get to. 
We'll now take a little bit under an hour break. We'll be back here at 3.30 Eastern Daylight Time uh, to kick off our next conversation, Transformation and Recovery, The Money Question, with Mark Moody Joseph, Maureen Knighton, Linda Brumbach, Ed Porras, and Liz Lerman. See you at 3.30. Thank you.